Hello, everyone out there, and welcome to the Art of Attraction with Domini Drew. It is a beautiful day out there today, and I'm here with my co-host, Caitlin Wright. Caitlin, thank you so much for joining me. Thank you for having me once again. <laughs> my pleasure. Now, we are, we have a guest today who I'm trying to figure out how to add on Facebook Live, so we may just need to uh, fuss just for a minute or two. But I'm going to see, uh, Kaylin, am I coming through on Facebook on your end? Not quite yet. Okay. Excuse us for the delay, listeners. We will be right with you. Okay. I have you here. Coming through? Mm -hmm. Great. All right, so I'm just going to check in with our guest and let him know that we will be live here. For listeners, I think you all know that my gifts, while many and varied, do not really include technology and sound equipment. <laughs> so uh, many apologies for that. However, we do have a fantastic guest for you today uh, and a fantastic show for you today in general. Uh, so do stand by for that. Um, and meanwhile, talk a little bit about me and what I do. So if you're one of our regular listeners, uh, I think we've got about 20,000 of them. Thank you so much for joining. Thanks for being fans. Um, if, you, if you are one of our, our regulars, then you know that my specialty is really in helping single men to attract life partners through personal and relationship coaching. And, you know, the way that we do this is really uh, an inside to outside process, right? So rather than sort of, you know, dating tips and tricks and here's what you say and here's what you should try, it's really about, you know, how are you holding yourself back? Like, what is it that you are putting out to people, um, to women or to men, whoever it is that you're interested in dating, um, without meaning to? right? So we pick up these, you know, habits, beliefs, um, you know, uh, images, we call them sort of misconceptions, assumptions about the world from a very young age. And even though they're formed so long ago, they, they stick in our subconscious and our subconscious is extremely powerful. And so if you have a, you know, if you had an experience as a child that led you to believe that, you know, you're not good enough, um, then you will project that. You will literally see it everywhere in the world because it's something that you believe. So it will really follow you around. Um, and, you know, Caitlin and I have a lot of experience. Caitlin works with me um, in my practice, which is called Domini Drew Coaching, Consulting and Speaking. Um, and what we do is we talk to a lot of single men who are really struggling and genuinely they have no idea why. And so primarily they are either, um, they are either, uh, perpetually single and have no idea why or what to do about it, um, or they're repeatedly attracting the same relationship over and over and over again and have no idea why, or, you know, they really struggle with low self-confidence and they're unable to really approach, um, to really approach the women that they're interested in. And, um, Caitlin, you know, what are your, what are your thoughts on that? I know we talked to a lot of people. Um, what have you found about, you know, those, those perspectives, those issues, and, you know, what you've found to work through them? Mm. Well, I definitely come across a lot of uh, low self-confidence, um, self-esteem, and a lot of times it's affected by um, past relationships and things that they've experienced and just gotten so bad or up to the point that they, they really can't approach um, or they don't know what to say once they do approach. And they end up either settling with, um, with women that aren't a good fit for them or, or finding themselves in a relationship, like you said, that they're, that they're just repeatedly attracting these um, negative patterns within their relationship. And so it really seems to be um, a combination of, of a lot of things for a lot of our listeners or for a lot of our um, clients that we speak to. 
Yeah. And, you know, a lot of that really, it comes down, especially the, the, the low self-confidence or fear of rejection, you know, difficulty approaching um, can, really, can really come down to, uh, to anxiety and overthinking, um, which I know is, is something that you've spoken about in the show that really used to be an issue for you. And we've really addressed that um, uh, pretty, oh, yeah. pretty strongly <laughs> with you. Uh, you want to talk about that for a minute? Oh, sure. Um, well, I, I really dealt with, and still do, um, anxiety. It used to, you know, it used to be just terrible. Um, it got to the point where, yes, it, it caused me to overthink so much that I couldn't, um, I couldn't go into a restaurant and order for myself. Um, I couldn't really go into any place that I didn't already know and wasn't comfortable with, um, um, I, I couldn't, a lot of things. It just, I just found myself really, um, really hiding, um, in my own, in my own place and, and not wanting to leave, not really wanting to talk to new people, um, not wanting to do really anything new because it gave me such anxiety. Mm. Um, in that I think we brought it back to uh, fear and what was underneath that anxiety was just fear of almost everything, fear of life, um, fear of experiencing things, fear of experiencing pain, fear of experiencing uh, too much um, too much pleasure, really. Um, mm. So, yeah, it kind, of, it kind of comes down to I was hiding, um, hiding from all of these emotions because I was afraid of my reaction and, and what I was, and what I'd go through from there. So it, it kept me from doing so many things, including in my relationships. I, like I said before, um, I found myself in um, relationships where, you know, it, they weren't not, not only weren't they a good fit, but they were they were terrible. Um, they were negative, and that affected my self confidence and in mm. so many things from there. Um, so, yeah, it, it just plays such a big part in not only your relationship life, but but really so many other parts of your life. And, and um, after, after really just, I don't know, how, how long would you say, Domini, um, did you, you work through the anxiety with me? And, and it, was, it was very quick. It was, a, it was a very quick turnaround for me to, to look at my anxiety in a whole different way. And um, wow, now, now it's just so much easier to, to function in my life. Yeah. And I'm not going to cry. Not <laughs> <laughs> but it is, though. It's such deep work. I was I was just on the on the on a call with someone just got a a new client who um who really struggled with with low self confidence and he was saying you know it's just just I just can't find anyone I just can't you know I just haven't met the right one yet and I'm you know this was the end of our call and the things that he'd said earlier um were along the lines of well um you know I don't know how to uh, you know, that I have, I have insecurities and over the years, you know, that, that low self-confidence, those insecurities have, have cost me a lot of missed opportunities. That was what he said. And so I said to him, so, so it's about finding someone. It's about not finding the right person. He's like, yeah, I'm sure as soon as I find the right person, it'll be fine. Um, but you know, if you listen to what he said, he's, he's 30, 35 years old. And he said that if he, um, doesn't have, you know, if, if he, hadn't been so insecure for all those years that he, you know, he'd missed out on all these opportunities. So I was like, if you find the right person, you're still going to miss her. You know, if you're in your head, you're overthinking your, um, uh, you know, your, your, yeah, it really comes down to, to overthinking, especially when with, with, you know, what we call this approach anxiety when it applies to dating, but it's exactly the same thing that, that you were saying you went through Caitlin. Um, and, uh, and, and, you know, the, and the effects and, and how that affects, you know, men in the dating world is, is very much, you know, sort of in the, that approach and really overthinking and, um, and self-sabotaging, you know, that's kind of really what it comes down to. Mm -hmm. So I seem to need something. I, I don't seem to be able to bring our guest on. Our guest is here waiting and, um, I would very much like, um, uh, Kenny, would you be would it be possible for you to call in on Skype on the number on the screen? Because it's possible I can just add you here and we can hear you, um, which would be great if you're still there. So give me a call. Number is on the screen.
All right, we're going to give that a shot. And I'm sorry for this about it, guys, but uh, I said, I'm, I'm sorry. I, I'm sorry about this for you guys, but um, I think this guy's going to be really interesting to talk to. Um, he's got, uh, you know, in some ways, he's similar to the work that I do and in some ways different, um, but it's really, uh, I think it's gonna be a, a real treat to have, um, to have some, some new perspectives. And, and I really enjoy, um, you know, and, and, and a shout out as well to people who, you know, who work in this area or who are fascinated with this area and would like to share, you know, always feel free to call in. Uh, the number is, is on the screen and for the uh, people on the radio, uh, this is, the number is 708-793-7769. And again, that's 708 708- Seven nine three seven seven six nine. So we're going to see if we can get uh, Kenny on here joining us so that we can. <laughs> so we can get him on live. Okay. Hello, Kenny, can you hear me? Okay. Don't seem to have anybody yet. Hello, Kenny. Can you hear me? Are you coming through? Nope, I'm not. I got the call answered, but I'm not hearing you yet. Okay, let me just check mine too. That should all be fine. Okay. All right, I think we put uh, we put Caitlin on hold while we did this. That is okay. Okay, he's hearing us. We're just not hearing him. Let's try and give that another call. Okay, so he's going to work that out. And we're going to come back to Caitlin. All right, Caitlin, you've been on hold. Sorry about that. Just, just a few You're coming moments. back? Um, hey. Nope. Hi. Sorry. Hey. You were on hold for a minute there. Can you start over? <laughs> oh, sure. Um, I, I didn't Poor Caitlin has to that. put up with all my issues I, all the time. <laughs> please, please. I think it's the other way around. Actually, I was just about to talk to him about some of my issues. Excellent. I, um, I learned more about last night. I, um, I realized with some help that I have some self-worth issues that are affecting um, affecting the way I function in, in life. Mm. And I didn't realize it, how much it affects, okay, something similar. Oops. You dropped off. Food and they bring it and it does. Oh. Hey, start, sorry, start, mm-hmm. that, start that sentence over again. You said you were having... Um, uh, self worth issues, and then it looks like we had a little a little signal cut out. But you're back now. Oh, okay. Um, oh, I was just mentioning uh, now that I can actually go out and um, got over a little bit of more of that anxiety of going out and ordering for myself. Um, hmm. Something as simple as giving a plate back or sending it back to the kitchen, hmm. I would never do. That is so I interesting. Do it. That is so interesting. I'm just going to see if I can add Kenny in here, but I want to add to that as well. Um, it's uh, it's, it's really, it's really quite interesting because I, I actually had the exact same, I guess I actually used to have the exact same issue. Um, I couldn't, uh, I couldn't order anything. I couldn't send anything back. Um, it was like shame for me somehow. Um, and, uh, it, I, I don't know. I felt so embarrassed. I couldn't even, I couldn't even hold a boundary. I couldn't say no. Um, it was, it was so 
it was so anxiety inducing that I, yeah, I, I, I literally used to be, it's so funny you should use that example. Cause I used to not be able to send anything back at the restaurant. Um, I would just sort of suffer. Like, I don't know. I thought that was better somehow. Anyway, carry on. Oh, well, basically, yes. They, and that was, that's basically, I felt just, well, I don't want to be, I don't want to be a burden. Like I don't want to um, be in anybody's way. I, I would physically shrug my shoulders up and clasp my hands in front of myself and try and make myself as small as possible mm. to, to get out of the way. And I actually find that I, I do this all the time and I'm just becoming aware of it and um, just starting to realize how much it is affecting um, in my life. Basically, shrug my shoulders up and clasp my hands in front of myself and try and make myself as small Kenny, as do we have you live here? I think so. Can you hear me? Yeah, you certainly can. Welcome, welcome. We finally got it figured out. <laughs> we did. I'm so sorry about that. Thank you so much for, uh, for sticking with me. Yeah, no worries. It happens, right? It does indeed. Um, all right, great. So, uh, so Kenny, thank, thank you so much for joining us for on, on our show. Um, Caitlin and I, I think you were listening, uh, we're just talking about some of the anxiety issues that our, that our guys go through. Um, as you know, we, we specialize in working with, with single men and helping them attract life partners. And I'm, I'm really fascinated to hear about, you know, what it is that you do and, um, and, you know, what you love about it and what you're fascinated in about it and, and everything else. You bet. Well, yeah, I, I caught pieces of it as I was trying to figure all this out. It, <laughs> it sounded like, you know, you were helping a client who's struggling with uh, self-esteem and, and trying to, you know, really figure out their dating life. And I, I mean, I guess the short story for me is, um, you know, I, I grew up always being able to feel what was going on. And about 10, 12 years old, I woke up in the middle of the night, found my mom passed out naked on the toilet. She was an alcoholic. And let's face it, none of us are taught anything about how to be a parent, how to have a relationship, deal with emotions. And I'm so, so glad to my, hear you say that. I, I find that's missed so often. You know, like my, it's insane. It's, yeah. it's, it's insane. The guys will be like, I don't know, I should have figured this out by now. And and I go, why did, did someone teach you how to, how to do and sex, sex is the same way for me. It's like, Oh, you know, people expect, you know, incredible sexual skills, but, but who's teaching it? Like who's where, where's the class? There's yeah, there's such a bias and shame. I tell a story in speeches. I'll ask somebody, I'm like, let me cut your hair, you know? And they're like, no. And I'm like, why not? Well, have you taken a class? And of course, and I'm like, you know, I'm 52 years old. I've been watching people for 40 some years. Isn't that enough? And they're like, well, no. And I said, well, what about this? What if I told you both of my parents were hairstylists, brothers and sisters, aunts and uncles. I spent my whole life in the salon watching them cut hair. Would that be enough? And they're like, no, I, I'd want you to take a class. And I'm like, I find that fascinating. Your hair. <laughs> something that no matter how badly I butcher it will grow back perfectly on its own. You expect me not just to take a class and even the government demands I have a license to get near it, but to learn a, to be a parent, have a relationship. What if all of us say, Oh, I don't need to know about that. I watch. So it's okay to sit in the salon and watch people who had no training either. There's just so much shame around admitting we don't know how. Yes. And so, well, everybody like simultaneously that. doesn't really know how. So it's like we're all sort of ashamed of these things that are really so incredibly common. And people talk, get the exactly. advice from their friends. Well, my friends tell me this, this, and this. And I listen yeah. to the advice their friends say, and I'm like, sweetheart, <laughs> you need to not get dating advice from your friends. Like, well, what makes you yeah. think that they are, you know, even if they're in a happy relationship, what makes you think that they have expertise that they can share with you? <laughs> exactly. So from there, I kind of lived the, the normal American life. I became an alcoholic, a sex addict, spending <laughs> addict, sugar addict, tobacco oh, addict. Oh, you really covered addict. all your bases. I like it. <laughs> yeah. I went through two horrific divorces, mm. child custody battle, bankruptcy. I played two professional sports. I never wanted to play. I contemplated suicide. Um, now, luckily for me, I always had a fascination for why I was such a train wreck. So I've been studying psychology and personal growth since my early 20s and and I just discovered something I have some stuff I haven't heard anybody ever talk about and I wrote about it in my book your journey to success and then I started something called the greatness movement 
so the two in conjunction, you know, the, the whole idea is really to create a change in society that I, I'm not asking for government to teach us how to parent or any of that, but for to break down this belief that we don't need to learn about it. And, and, and also the belief, there's several beliefs. Everyone thinks if you change your thoughts, you can change your life. And, and your thoughts are a byproduct, byproduct of your feelings. And until you learn how to shift your feelings, your thoughts really won't change. So positive thinking for the most part is kind of a waste of time. If there's a process to learn how to shift your feelings. That is and so, I, I that, literally and, have an entire yeah. episode that's, that's, this la- that's labeled exactly that. How positive thinking, like, I can't remember what exactly I called it, but like the, the pitfalls basically. Um, yeah. And that's so funny. I, uh, that's another thing I haven't heard anybody else say, but that I say all the time because yeah. people say, and, and people end up wishing it away. Have you, have you found that? It's like the difference between sort of, you know, setting your intention and, and intending to be more positive or intending not to wallow on the, the, the negative versus, um, you know, going to quote unquote positive thinking in order to avoid the uncomfortable feelings of what's actually going on. Yeah, that's, I, I talk about a cycle that where every single person on this planet is in. It's something I kind of put together that I haven't heard anyone talk about. And you're talking about the last two stages of it, which are shame and denial. We create a, because of the trauma we go through as kids, and, and every person's been through trauma, it's unavoidable. Mm-hmm. Uh, the last two stages are shame, and shame is a false persona. And so what you're talking about, the positive thinking is, I have to be this certain person. It's the person I adapted to survive what I went through. Mm -hmm. And so the positive thinking becomes the fourth part of the stage, denial. Um, That's the single greatest killer in society right now. And nobody's talking about denial. And really, I'm an expert in how denial works. And and that's, whether it's dating, whatever it is in your life, really, it's it's a lack of an awareness of how denial works and how we're all in denial. Mm. I love, I love how you say that. And that's, and that's probably, and Caitlin can probably, you know, confirm this with me as well. Um, A lot of people, I, I was actually just, just writing a a little article about this. Um, I think one of the, pretty much exactly what you just said, one of the greatest sort of human uh, misconceptions or fallacies right now is that, you know, our lives have nothing to do with us. We have no real responsibility for it, which I think is probably the most I think, Caitlin, would you say this is the most common form of denial that we come across is like, it's not me. You know, oh, it's my, my town yeah. is too small or women don't want this any, you know, women don't want commitment these days mm-hmm. or, you know, it's, it's always sort of out there. And, you know, I, the, my, my sort of line that I came up for with this is the extent to which you refuse to take responsibility for your life is the extent to which you're powerless to change it. Yeah, that, I call that professional victimhood. We have a society that rewards the victim. Yep. Think of it. Whenever you get sick, hurt, have a bad relationship, a bad job, everybody comes to your rescue. It works. That's why we do it. And that's part of the cycle I mm-hmm. talk about. Because as kids, our inherent power is taken from us. Um, you know, And it can be traumatic stuff like I went through, or just simply a controlling parent or a negative parent. I mean, very simple things arguing with your parent who takes your reality away say the parents had a fight and you walk in and go what were you guys fighting about oh we weren't fighting mm, well that right there mm. strips a kid of his inherent reality and his inherent power and so that's where that third piece we create a false persona and we we re-victimize ourselves on purpose almost all of us don't even realize it Yep. Every friend, every career. I know by your career, I know what your childhood was like. You'll pick it to re-victimize yourself. And so because people aren't aware of that, they're re-victimizing themselves. And then the denial piece, we just keep this cycle going. Um, and in most part, because no one's ever talked about it. Mm-hmm. and no one. So it's a lack of information. It's not, none of us are bad. None of us are, you know, um, uh, incapable of, of growing past this. We just don't have the information. That's all. Yeah. And it also looks that way. I mean, as you said, you said, you know, being, uh, being fed by society, but also just the direct feedback of it looks like life is happening outside of us. Like it really does, you know, and now it's, you know, I sort of, (laughs) sort of hear us say it of like, Oh, life's within your power. And that's become sort of almost like this trite sort of line. 
and truly I, I haven't experienced anything more true <laughs> in my, you know, in my 15 years of, of exploring this world. Well, like one of, one of the things, you know, one word I, I'm really not a fan of is accident. I had an accident. You'll hear people say I had a car accident. Yep. It wasn't my fault. Yep. Well, what time of day did it happen? Oh, I was driving home from work. How many years have you been at that job? 15 years. How many years have you taken that same path? 15 years. You've made thousands of choices throughout the day to put yourself in that position at that time, whether you left early, left late, how, whatever it was you were doing. Mm. There's no accident there. You know, but that's again, it allows that victim mentality of it's happening to me. And especially in relationships, it, you, you want to talk about you know, the quintessential issue in relationships, it's denial. And most of it is because every relationship out there, the model we've all seen is nothing but pure codependency. What we think is love is actually something called love addiction and love avoidance. Mm. It's not love. And so what everybody's seeking is something called intensity. They think that's love, but what they're actually picking is their trauma partner. That instant feeling when you walk in the door and feel butterflies, that's a red flag. The reason you feel butterflies is they remind you heavily and specifically of the abandonment or whatever it was you went through as a child. And so your brain, it's like cocaine. It's, oh my God, I get to relive it. Mm. And so we've all been told and conditioned that's what you're looking for, but love is incredibly boring and quiet. But we don't want that because of the the addiction to the victimhood, we seek that intensity and that victimization. And so boring, we run from. And so I had to learn that with my, when I went through counseling, I was like, when will I know? And he goes, Kenny, when the women that you're attracted to now, or the women you're not attracted to now, the boring ones, when you start finding them attractive, that's when you'll know. And I was like, you've got to be crazy. <laughs> yes. That's ugly. terrible. <laughs> yeah. But eventually I was like, oh my God, when you do the codependency and enmeshment work and you learn about addiction and love avoidance, that's when it all shifts. And that's, so the reason in my experience, we can't find partners, it's, we're always the problem. And it's a lack of information of how all this works. Yep. That's been my, that's been my experience as well. And I love that you just brought up, um, not just the love addiction, love avoidance, which I would love for you to define further. Um, sure. If you, if you be willing. Um, oh yeah. But also that, yeah, yeah the, 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 the fear of boredom, that's actually something, it's so interesting. You're nailing a, a lot of my experiences. I've, uh, as you know, I've, I've done this for uh, you know, a decade and a half and I've gone through, found a lot of very deep underlying beliefs that I carry. And one of them was what ended up being kind of a, an addiction to struggle or a, for me, yeah. you know, subconsciously I, I was associating struggle with life force. And so the word boring uh, uh, resonated for me there because my whole fear was if I, if I stop struggling, <laughs> that life would be boring. And yeah. life being boring is like sort of like the, the like suburban life for, for me personally is like a, like a nightmare. Like I, I don't, I, I so don't want that, that I'd rather be sort of on, on either end of it, you know, for better or worse, yeah. that's sort of how I am. But that used to be much more extreme. Like I was, I was actually petrified of being in the middle. And part of that quote unquote being in the middle was, you know, for me was, was, you know, fear of, of being bored and just, just being happy, you know, sounded terrible. So you're right. It's like sometimes the healthier, healthier thing is like, and, and especially for the guys that we talk to, a lot of them have drama issues. You know, they're attracted to the, the women who are crazy, you know, who have got the, I hate to sort of use those terms, but um, the, the ones that, that do drama all the time, all the time. And they just, you know, they didn't know how to get out. Yeah. That, that's um, a result of childhood trauma. There was mm -hmm. chaos. I mean, that just tells me about what your childhood was like. There was a lot of chaos. And so like with me, with the alcoholism and other things in childhood, if, if here was the thing, if it was quiet it meant my mom was drunk. So it, it, I would, you know, anyone that calls in or has that boredom issue, that's the question. What, what, was, what was going on at home? And what did it mean when it was boring? And for me, it meant my mom was drunk. And the other thing is my parents early in the morning on weekends and stuff would say, okay, you know, out the door, go play. We'll see you at dinner. Well, we, uh, we, 
you know, one point we lived way out, no one was around. So boredom was complete powerlessness. And that's mm. mostly what people are feeling with boredom is because as kids during that traumatic time, they felt incredibly powerless when it got quiet. And so that's why they're looking for, as you call them, drama kings or queens mm. or all that intensity. It keeps them from having to relive the painful feelings they went through as a kid. So if they go back and clean that up, then they'll be able to pick somebody different. Now, as far as the love addiction and love avoidance, basically <clears throat> a love addict was primarily abandoned as a child. A love avoidant was primarily enmeshed. And what I mean by enmeshed, like all these kids on campuses right now who are screaming for safe zones, that's a product of enmeshment. Their parents took care of everything. They overloved them. Like I just saw, as I was trying to find you, this post on Facebook, this woman posted a picture of probably a seven, eight-year-old daughter. And she said, this is my oxygen. Whoa. Oh, my God. <laughs> oh red flag. And that's what we think <laughs> is loving parenting is, oh, my God, I live for my kids. That is a massive, massive red flag. So, so that's, a great, that's a great example. So that, that, that particular child who's got a mother who says that, what is, you know, your, your best guess, what is her issue going to be when she grows up? How's that going to manifest uh, for her? She'll have, she will, it'll be impossible for her to connect to somebody because um, unless she does, let's assume she never does any work on it. Mm -hmm. She will, she'll pick love addicts and, and she's going to struggle all of her life to connect with anyone. She'll be very controlling, very distant. Um, most, here's how it works. Women love avoidance primarily get sick and hurt a lot. That's how they keep distance because they're avoiding love. Their primary fear is intimacy, getting close because they were so smothered. They had too much of it so early they on. Will, mm -hmm. So they will use illness and injury to keep them away. They also will overattach to their children and especially animals. You see people who are highly into animals. That's people who because think of it, an animal, the, the affection only goes one way. You never have to give. And so people are, high, I tell any one of my dating clients, someone who's highly into animals, that's a red flag. You will always be the surrogate spouse to their animals. Hmm. And so you have to decide if you're okay with that. But so they'll use animals and they will primarily have um, intimate or uh, non-sexual, you know, these women who have the best friend who's a guy that they never sleep with, mm -hmm. that they tell the whole life story to, but they don't tell their intimate details to their husband or boyfriend. That's a byproduct of enmeshment. It's a little because safer. See, now she, yeah, she has two people chasing her, but she doesn't have to commit to either. Mm -hmm. And she's withholding information. So she's in control. It's a power position. The, the love avoidant is all about power. Now, a man love avoidant will primarily use work, hobbies. He'll have sexual affairs outside of... So they're always seeking intensity outside of the relationship. And most of the time, they're very valid excuses. Like men, hey, honey, I'm working really hard here to support the family. How does a woman argue with that? Or loving the kids, you know, how, how can you argue with that as a man? So they're very justifiable. But what attracts the love addict to the love avoidant is they're highly seductive. Women primarily use, you know, sex or, or flirting. You know, there's a sexual dynamic. Men use money, they're, you know, or intelligence or, or power, their, you know, power position. Both sides will do that. So the love addict sees the love avoidant as this superhero rescuer because they were so um, abandoned as a child. And in the beginning, that's the butterflies, that intense, oh my God, this is great. At some point, it could be a week, it could be three years, the love avoidant gets triggered and they turn away. They start pursuing outside interests. Mm. The love addict will chase and chase and chase. You've seen this. The, what was that, that girl who sent 10,000 text messages or to that one guy, you know, and, and they just chase and eventually they drop into reality. They go, oh, they're not available. Because they've given up their whole life. They get rid of their friends. They change the way they dress. Everything to please the avoidant. At some point, they start to pout. They turn away. Because let me give you the, the primary fears. The primary fear of the avoidant is intimacy. 
their secondary subconscious fear is abandonment. For the love addict, it's the polar opposite. Primary fear is abandon, abandonment. Subconscious fear is um, um, intimacy. So they chase, they realize the avoidant isn't available. They turn away through pouting, through maybe they start to get back into their life. And for a little bit, the avoidance like, oh my God, I can finally breathe. They're off my back. And then their abandonment triggers. And we've all been through this. They come crawling back. You know what? You're so right. I've mm. been so selfish. I've been working too much. I haven't been sleeping with you enough. Or I'm so sorry. Yes. And the addict's like, see, how many times have you said this to somebody? See, I knew this is the real you. If you just be vulnerable with me, we could have this great relationship. And I literally, the whole process speeds up. And I'll have couples sitting in my office and literally in a sentence, I'll watch them just flip mm. back and forth, turn and walk away. So wow. there's a great book out there by a lady, lady named Pia Melody. It's P-I-A-M-E-L-L-O-D-Y. Her book, Facing Codependence, and her other book, Facing Love Addiction, should be required reading by all adults before ever getting near a relationship. You will, your life will change drastically when you read those two books. You'll see anyone having relationship problems, they'll go, oh my God, this is the answer. This is what's been going on. Brilliant. So... So let's say that some of our listeners are identifying with one or the other, and let's say that they're single. So um, some are identifying as the uh, the love addict, and some as the um, love avoidant, for lack of a better term. Um, yeah. So if they're if they're identifying themselves as one or the other, they're single. What what would you recommend for them to look out for, or look inward for, or what advice would you give them? Both need massive self esteem work. Um, you know, it's, they're both looking for outside esteem in different ways. Mm -hmm. um, so that I always recommend Louise Hay's book, um, How to Heal Your Life, mm. because she, to me, that's the best self-esteem book out there, mirror work. And the only thing I'd change in her book is she used the word thoughts all the time, substitute thoughts for feelings. Oh, and and God. every time you thoughts, you're fantastic. That's exactly what I say all the time. I love it. <laughs> you're yeah. validating everything. I'm like, forget thoughts, feelings in your body. Yeah. Everything's happening in your yeah, body. You gotta feel it. It's it, it you can't think differently till you feel differently. Yep. So and at any rate, so and that's you can't it. think your way into feeling differently, right? No, you can't. <laughs> no. It, it's it's uh, my book is the one if you want to learn how to shift the way you feel my book, Your Journey to Success, is the one for that. And tell people where they, can, I, where they can find that. Um, Amazon. It's available in paperback, in Audible, and in Kindle. Great. And I go through the whole process. And, and there, I suggest, I've never seen an author do this, but I suggest a ton of books in there that are, should be a part of your process as well. Good. And these are some. Good. But, That's um, as far as the addict, they they need to build a life outside of the avoidance. So that's, you know, what are their needs? Because when you go through abandonment, you give away your whole life just so somebody will stay close to you. So mm -hmm. they don't know what their needs and wants are. They don't know their morals and values. So it's about building a life separate from somebody else. And that's the biggest piece for them. Now, for the love avoidant, it's the opposite. It's getting out of their life. And they have to be, they have to switch and become the initiator. It's their job to get vulnerable. They need to join intimacy type groups, codependency groups. I don't care, even an AA group, even if you're not an alcoholic, but it's learning to get vulnerable. And so for them, like my clients like that, my, one of the suggestions I give them is they have to make a phone call every day where they share three feelings with somebody. It's their job to initiate it. In a relationship, it's their job to initiate a date. It's their job to initiate sex. They have to take ownership of creating intimacy and dealing and learning how to deal with the intimacy fears that come from being the initiator. So this is a again very similar to the work I do, and and you know getting those personality types to really. Um, to really risk, you know, that, that feeling, I don't know if you've, if you identified as that and you've ever had to really face that vulnerability inside, but it is 
absolutely terrifying. When they come up against that and that fear comes in, what advice do you have for how to really push through that? Well, fear is always one of three things. It's either the fear of rejection, the fear of inadequacy. In other words, I don't have the skills, tools, or knowledge to do something or the fear of powerlessness. So the first question, whenever fear comes up, or here's something else. If you ever hear yourself say stress or ang anxious or anxiety, the clinical definition of both are fear. That's another gap I stepped into and I talk about in my book is we misdiagnose everything because both of those go back to the point you're saying, oh, life's happening to me, I'm stressed, I'm anxious, it's not about me, it's outside of me. But the clinical definition to stress and anxiety is fear. Mm. So first, get into reality. You're in white hot fear. Ask yourself those three questions. Do I fear rejection, inadequacy, or powerlessness? I'm going to start with mm. an inadequacy because that's the easiest to fix. Inadequacy is, you know, that's like starting a new job. Well, I don't really know the computer system. I, I'm not quite sure how to do this. Or, uh, you know, I'm going off to start a new sport. What are the tools and equipment I need? That's a simple fear to fix. Just go become an expert, read up on it, take classes, that fear goes away. Um, most fears are the fear of rejection or the fear of inadequacy. The fear of rejection is all about a lack of self-esteem. And so this person, this hypothetical person that you brought up, nobody can ever, ever validate us, ever. And that's primarily what we're looking for in a relationship. So if you fear rejection, you're looking for outside esteem. So then the process is affirmations, mirror work. Um, it's, you know, you, I'm sure you, I don't need to get into all that. I'm sure you talk in your show how to build self-esteem. Mm. If people are unaware, it's in my book too. Um, you know, much more detail. So if, if you're fearing rejection, it's you're looking outside of yourself for validation so that's get into your own life and start focusing on your needs and wants and filling them yourself instead of expecting someone else to do them. Now, powerlessness is the most difficult. And powerlessness comes from more often than not, we say yes to things we want to say no to. And here's a perfect example. We've all done this in a relationship where we've screamed at our partner, I've been doing A, B, C, and D for you, and you won't even do Y. Mm. Well, you set up your own powerlessness. What that tells me is you were trying to manipulate them. You did A, B, C, and D, most likely because you lack self-esteem and you were trying to manipulate Y from them. Mm -hmm. and, and when they didn't give it to you, you got upset. Well, that's your fault. It's not theirs because it's not their job to meet it. And what that tells me is, you needed to say no. The most kind and loving thing and most powerful thing you can ever say in a relationship is no. And I think I heard you glancing on this as, as we started to talk. We've all been raised, TV, movies, everything. We're supposed to say yes in relationship. That's the most destructive word ever mm -hmm. because that's what it creates is powerlessness. And so powerlessness is about going against our morals and values. So that person who said A, B, C, and D, they did something they didn't really want to do, whether it broke their morals and values or they were trying to do it to get something in return. Mm. They set up their own powerlessness. So that, to answer your question, those are the three questions whenever somebody's in fear. And obviously, I can't get into all the detail and remedies for each of them, sure. but they're all in my book. And that's what I have everybody do. The second you do that, you get in the habit of asking those three questions and then all the different answers I supply, the fear goes away. Hmm. That's a great breakdown. Um, I'm just noticing, you know, on, on Facebook here, we have, a, we have a question, which is interesting. You're talking about powerlessness. Um, also, I'll just go ahead and read it out and you can go ahead and respond to it. Uh, this is Joey okay. and he says, when we realize love is temporary, how do you suggest unfreezing that cardiac chamber? Realizing love is temporary, well, that's a choice. <laughs> right. What? So right there, right <laughs> there, he, he's telling me he wants temporary love, and so that's what he keeps choosing. And if he's, I think you said he's an avoidant. Well, that explains why he's an avoidant. Mm -hmm. Because it's always, love is always temporary for him. And, and he wants it that way, because then he doesn't have to face the 
intimacy fears, possibly most likely powerlessness, because he's, if he's an avoidant, most likely he was suffocated emotionally. And so that's his attempt to keep power. And remember, the avoidant, it's, all a, it's a power dynamic. So just in his question, he explained his whole avoidant operating system. Brilliant. Yeah. And so it's a choice. you want to stay there or move out of it? That would be a different question. Yeah, I agree. And, and it's really, you know, on this show, we talk about, you know, what I like to call images or those, those subconscious beliefs, which form in childhood or those reactions and assumptions that we have. And uh, I love that you said that that's, that's uh, very much my style as well is often the way we ask the question um, clues us in a lot to what the answer really is. Um, so well, when, when we realize love is temporary, it's like you're assuming that love is temporary or assuming that everybody else finds that love is temporary, but you're, the way you're phrasing it is like, oh, you know, since we all know this um, as kind of a generality, which is how those, those images tend to show up in language. Here's the other thing is when I, you know, hear words, I ignore I, what I tell everybody. I do a whole seminar on this is how to listen to people, ignore their words, listen for the emotional content. Mm. Look at the three words he chose, unfreezing cardiac chamber. Well, that tells me what his childhood was like and how suffocating and frozen he felt by the way he was suffocated emotionally. It was a cardiac chamber. Mm. See, I mean, that's, that's how he feels. We don't just pick those words out of the air. That's a direct description of what childhood was like for him emotionally. And that breaks my heart that that's what he had to go through to survive childhood. Yeah. And I think that's that experience is shared by so many people. And I yeah. also want to say, you know, Joey and to anybody else who, who feels that way. Yes, this, this can be, a, you know, really difficult. You can feel shut down. You can feel frozen. Everything is reversible, not reversible, but growing through a bull. Okay. Everything yeah. can be fixed. Everything, you know, if you're, you don't feel anything or I don't feel love, it's not just how you are. You know, again, that's, that's sliding into that victim mentality. Everything, I mean, way more than you think. And I've been doing this for 15 years, way more things than you think are fixable are fixable, you know, aspects of how you are and how your relationships are and how the world around you is, you know, with, with the type of work that, you know, you're doing such a beautiful job explaining Kenny is you know, so much, so much is, um, can be adjust with different perspective and, and feeling the feelings in your body and, and life changes pretty profoundly. And it's, you know, for, I don't know his history, so I'm making a big assumption here, but mm -hmm. I'm going to assume he hasn't had an opportunity to figure out where that cardiac chamber originated. And so my book would walk him through how to discover how this all played out in his life and why he keeps choosing it. Um, because that's, my book is basically kind of the ultimate self-awareness process. Here's how you discover why it's an unfreezing cardiac chamber. Here's how you do it. Because I give a step-by-step -step process. Like I read this whole, I, I started researching belief and this was part of my frustration in this industry. There are tons of buzzwords, but very little detail like fear. People, oh, don't be afraid. But I, I don't know of anyone who's ever described fear like I just did. There, and then the plan to get out of it. You know, they just stop at the word. Mm -hmm. And I researched belief and I read all these great books of people whose lives were terrible and one day they quote unquote believed, but they never described how you get belief. Mm -hmm. and, and so that's what, you know, I'll, it's really quickly. <laughs> belief is just when your feelings and your thoughts line up. It's not your thoughts. So think of whenever you took a test in high school, you walked in someday and you just felt it. You knew you were gonna kill it. Or if you played a sport, I played two pro sports. Some days before a game, I just knew you couldn't beat me. Other days, I, I, no matter how hard I trained, done, practiced everything, I was gonna bomb and I did. The feeling drives belief. Mm. So be, belief is when your feelings and your thoughts line up. When those are two are in, line, in alignment, that's when you believe in yourself. But getting back to it, the, the lack of teaching how to create that belief, just the word, and that's where I got into, for someone like Joey, he's describing something, but there's no process to figure out where that comes from. And that's what my book will give you, is the process to discover how to unfreeze that chamber. 
brilliant. Yeah, I agree. There's a lot of buzzwords. You know, I was thinking as you were saying, um, be yourself is another one that I, I, I hear a lot. Just you do you, yeah. just be yourself. And like, you know, that means something to me now because I'm 15 years into this work. But a decade ago, I would have been like, yeah, that sounds great. How? What does that what does that even mean? I was so disconnected from self. And Caitlin, you may have a may have a similar experience here. Um, I was so disconnected from self that I, I couldn't even I couldn't even feel the disconnect. You know, I just thought, you know, there was something wrong with me or you know, other people could be themselves and I just couldn't. Oh yeah, I mean, I, I've um, talked about that in um, coming out of my last relationship. I had no idea who who I was. Yeah. Well, and here's something you have to realize: two thirds of the population can't even tell you what they feel. They would use like words like good, fine, bad. Yep. Those aren't feelings. Yep. So yep. that's the first hurdle is one, learn how to feel. Yep. And so like yep. I have my clients, I have them print off a, a, just go on Google, type in feelings list, there's thousands of them. And I have them keep that list with them for a week and start circling, you know, the common feelings they have throughout the day if something happened or whatever, they first have to get aware uh, that they actually feel what's triggering those feelings. And then it's, you know, long process back to where did it originate? Yeah. And so you'll see a common thread. That's when you'll start to be able to get the awareness of, you said, you know, just be yourself. Most people have no clue who they are. Yep. Not even close. Or how They'll to find say, it. Yeah. I'm sarcastic, I'm nice or whatever. Yep. But that's not who they are. Yep. Yeah, I've, I've really, I've found the same thing. That's exactly right. And, the, you know, being yourself and, and far as how, and I think that, that, you know, feelings list is a really interesting thing. What I do is I have them follow their breath and come down into their body, like consciously bring yeah. your awareness, follow your breath, see how far it goes down. This is how I do it. See how far it goes down, you know, sl take a few deep breaths, then bring your awareness to your breath. See how far down your torso that it comes without you doing anything. And then, you know, invite it into your belly and see if it'll go. And if not, that's fine. You, that sort of points out where, you know, where things are happening in your system. And then if you can, breathing all the way down into your pelvis. And when you do that and you take a few minutes to do so, um, you're really, you know, you're, you're much more deeply present. You're feeling yourself more. That's where all the feelings are. But of course, we spend up, you know, all this time up in our head and, and, uh, and going very quickly, for the most part, to avoid um, having to feel things. So we're just about out of time here. Kenny, thank you so much for joining us. Can you um, tell us a little bit about where we can find you and, and get help for our, our listeners who are interested in, in maybe working with you? You bet. First of all, thanks a lot for having me. I appreciate it. My pleasure. Um, I'm glad we got everything worked out. Yeah. Um, there are several, several places um, you can find me. My website, it's coachkennyweiss.com. Um, I have a YouTube channel with 100 or more different videos. So there's a bunch of free resources there. I have my book, Your Journey to Success, which you can find on Amazon in all three formats. Um, I also have my podcast, which is called Your Journey to Success, and that's every Sunday night at 7 p.m. Arizona time. You'll have to check because we don't change our time zones. Um, so there's that. And then finally, uh, www.thegreatnessmovement.com. I'm taking the things that I talk about in, in many of them, no, I haven't heard anybody ever talk about, and I'm creating a movement behind it. So I run mm. groups, some are in my office, others are online. So you can go to that if that's something you're interested in, um, in a group environment to learn the things that are in my book and all that. So I have quite a few options. Then there's my phone number, 480-729-3270. And I work with people all across the country, you know, from trauma to abuse. I'm usually one of, I typically are, my clients are those that have kind of been everywhere else, all the, all the seminars and everything else, and they want to go deeper. Um, either that or people who've suffered tremendous, you know, trauma or something in their past they haven't overcome yet. Those are my two pri primary kind of listeners, followers, and uh, clients. Great. Wonderful. All right. Well, you've heard it there. You can go ahead and reach out for some help. Kenny, thank you so much for joining us. Uh, that was really an honor. You bet. Thank you for having me. We'll have to get you on mine when I come, when I get back to having guests. Perfect. Um, I'll, I'll be your I'd numero uno. <laughs>
Sounds great. Dom. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Have a great day. You too. All right. This has been Dominique Drew with The Art of Attraction. Thank you so much for joining me. Thank you so much, Caitlin, for your contributions and for helping me co-host. Thank you so much, Dominique. <laughs> uh, if you'd like to find out more about my work and what I do, DominiDrew.com. Uh, past episodes of this show are on YouTube. You can just uh, go, uh, sorry, put Dominique Drew into YouTube and my channel is there. Um, and to find out you know, how to work with me, it's DominiDrew.com slash hello. And I will put the link in the description here of the video. Looking forward to speaking with you all and we'll see you next time. Thanks so much. Bye-bye.